faith, it's my pleasure to introduce to you two of our own, Beth Whitlock and Stephen Brown, who are both longtime members of the Athens Historical Society. Uh, they both serve on the board of directors now. Uh, Beth is a past secretary of the board. Stephen is the board historian. Beth is a retired uh, media school media specialist, and she now works here at the Athens uh, Library as in the in the heritage room, where among her many duties, she uh, produces the newsletter genealogy and history events. Stephen is retired, sort of, from the Harvard Library at UGA, the Russell Library. He uh, worked there for 35 years, and uh, while he has the title of Archivist Emeritus, he's still over there, I think, several times each week. They just, you know, he can't drag himself away, they can't get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stephen has been described as the man who, if you can't find a photograph there, or if you're searching for any nugget of information there, go see Steve, because he's a man with a photographic memory. <laughs> and if you don't know see, you can. So uh, Beth and Steve, uh, Stephen are both uh, immensely knowledgeable about Athens history, and I'm sure you're going to be really fascinated with the presentation they're going to give us today. So please welcome Beth Whitlock and Steve Brown. Larry. And uh, thank you all for showing up on behalf of our sponsors, the Heritage Room, the Hargrit, and of course the Athens Historical Society. I'm um, pleased so many people braved this rain. I don't know if you can hear it, but we have a really excited downspout out here. <laughs> One of the recurrent themes in Walter Warren Manning's planning is the value of living waters. So this is sort of his spirit visiting with us here. <laughs> We want to talk about a really fascinating collection that we have at the Harvard, a portion of it. There's much more in Ames, Iowa, where the official Manning archives are, but thanks to receiving the historic papers of the city uh, and the engineer's office, we have a fine, fine collection of Manning plans. We almost didn't have the report, which is central. We got a lot of photographs that Manning supplied from the 1920s as part of the program. I think it's going to be the fun part at the end. Uh, we almost didn't have that because we don't know where the Athens copy of the report is. Fortunately, in 1924, there was a young fellow working his way through college. This is the story I've been told. I haven't researched this. So don't, don't take notes, anybody. But there was a young fellow working his way through college by the name of Felix Hargrit. And apparently, after he paid for his college, and became an insurance executive and became a world-renowned collector of materials and the supporter of the Harvard Library, after whom it's named, he went to Roanoke, Virginia and found out they had a copy that they had bought of the 1925 report as an example of how to do city planning. So they had the Athens. So our Athens copy has Roanoke, Virginia stamped on the front, but that's good <laughs> enough for me because it is a real treasure. All right, well, let's uh, start in here with yesterday's vision, uh, you're going to find that I think many of you will be challenged by the maps. Uh, these didn't blow up very well. In the reception room afterwards, Mary Linneman has done her best job. Now, most of you know Mary Linneman at Harvard is doing a superb job. Unfortunately, her mega printer is dead. And until they resurrect it, we've had to make do with uh, skillful trimming, taping, and scanning. So, these are not the best maps, uh, but we encourage you, as always, to come by the harbor and see the real thing, because it's open to all of you. All right, now, don't fail me. <laughs> okay, 1925, Athens, 1924, when this starts. Athens is no longer our sleepy little brainy village where most people have big Greek revival houses on uh, whole block size lots with cows and horses out back and are, are there so the kids can walk to the university, etc. Uh, we've become a booming town since the Civil War. We now have 
railroads, instead of just being at the tail end of a sleepy little trail line up from Union Point, we have railroads running in and out of town, spiring out in every direction. Roadways also. We're sitting astride the brand new Bankhead Highway running down from Washington, D.C. out to San Diego. So we are really connected. Traffic is moving. The uh, town is filling up with automobiles, and we're having a little bit of trouble finding places to park them. Uh, good thing we solved that. Uh, <laughs> so the, the town is, is, is really booming inland market exporting cotton, cotton seed oil fertilizers, all sorts of products, but with it, uh, we've got our growing pains. We have not provided for parks at all. I mean, geez, like just yesterday, you want, a, you want parks? Walk a block here in the country. Go hang out with the Lintons up at Linton Springs. But these private solutions were no longer working. It was a long way out of town, even past the streetcars. This, by the way, is a 1909 view of the town, but uh, it was probably just as confused by 1924. So we've got a lot of future, a lot of problems too. It's still, of course, needless to say, is a terribly segregated community. Race relations are pretty good in 24, considering that's the high watermark of the Ku Klux Klan and violence. But it still is strictly segregated. And a lot of African Americans, uh, Many are still confined to substandard rental housing that has gone into any sort of uneven ground. That's the pattern. Nobody wants to have a house up on blocks or wells that drain or have privies that drain into them. The rougher land has gone mostly to the African American communities and a lot of that housing is very substandard and uh, probably the rents for it pay for more than one nice house out on Boulevard. So you know, it's not necessarily the choice of that community. So we've got that problem. Now, by being isolated, they have developed a really vigorous, amazing, fascinating, and separate social group. And uh, one recently discovered public, uh, publication we have at the Harvard that's being digitized, I advise you to look at, is the Athens Republique, which is the official newspaper of the African American community from about 1919 to 1926. The detail, the vibrancy, the events are fascinating. Um, it, it's a real thrill to read it and find out what's going on in Athens beyond the pages of the, the Banner and the Herald at the time. Okay, so we're obviously a community with a lot of potential, but we've got a lot of growing to do. Back. There. City of Athens. This is one of the plans that Manning had done of the existing situation. Uh, it's City of Athens buildings. He tried to draw in a little square for every building, every house that existed in Athens at the time. And I know you're not going to be able to make much of this map. You really have to encounter it. I've, I've turned these negative, I've blown them up, I've made them garish, I've covered them with colors of the rainbow, and they still aren't legible in a big auditorium. But we do own them. What you'll notice about Athens is there's some similarities. The industrial arc up around the seaboard and the factories up there sort of capped off growth to the north. Sort of the way Athens starts becoming isolated or, or individual neighborhoods today. There is very little growth yet on the east side. If you'll notice, there's not many houses out there. The roads are there, but it really hasn't developed the housing stock. South, they're just starting to trickle down into the University Drive area. It's still pretty sparse. The amazing part, though, is look to the west. As most of you know, the Athens, or excuse me, the Atlanta Highway would not be built until 1938 when they just blasted a line straight out of town over to Winder. In these days, to drive that fabulous Bankhead Highway I've mentioned, you've got to really wiggle through town. We're going to take a look at that in a moment. <coughs> so this is sort of the city of Athens, 1924, when we decided we need to have something done. Now, we've worked with master planning in Athens before. In 1905, Walter B. Hill and George Foster Peabody, the, uh, the great patron of the university, when they started buying up the land in the south to become the agricultural campus, they brought in George Foster Peabody's favorite planner from up in New York, um, Charles Levitt, Jr. And Levitt did a master plan for the campus. Uh, here you can see the North Campus lined up and a very romantic uh, um, painting down there. 
One thing you'll notice about the man, the uh, not the man, but the Levitt plan is he's in the city beautiful tradition. So look what he's done. He's knocked down those ugly contrasting old buildings like university, uh, like uh, old college, new college. Uh, he left Dennis the Indian on a fine campus, and he's got a rich sense of history. But by and large, you can see what he wants to do is get the bulldozers or the mules in those days and knock down all of this cluttery, individualized architectural stuff and build grand boulevards lined with trees. The whole North Campus would have an unbroken vista down to where the main library is today, a giant Roman-style chapel. Great love of the classical. Look at all these classical buildings lining up. There's interesting things in here. A woman's campus over where the Old Athens Cemetery is. We'd be seeing some real headlines about that. Uh, out here on the top of Lucas Hill, above the stadium, an engineering school, take that Georgia Tech. Uh, a lot of ambitious plans. And even though very little came of this, I still see references in university documents up in the 1930s as, well, this is consistent with the Levitt plan. I think that was the phrase they wanted. So they weren't sticking to it, but they weren't violating it. Now this, uh, you may be familiar with this picture. This is Daniel Burnham of Chicago's um, vision for Chicago. As you can see, we just knocked everything down by built nice uniform buildings and uh, stretched the boulevards out. This is after his more talented Georgia board and pro, uh, partner George, uh, John Wellborn Root died. So Burnham, who was the businessman into the things, uh, started doing stuff like this. Fortunately, if, for those of us who are romantics at heart, there is another tradition, a rich tradition, in American city planning, which draws more on the natural. Uh, Andrew Jackson Downing and, in this case, um, Frederick Law Olmsted. And as a young man, the subject of our spe speech today worked for him. Uh, this is the plan that he did for what would be sort of the epitome of this more romantic alternative to city beautiful. Instead of driving a grand boulevard for a chariot race with Roman temples along it, here in the uh, Piedmont Road Park, in Drew Park, that I'm, in, uh, Drew Hills, that I'm sure you're all familiar with, driving in the town, we use the natural landscape, we use the water, we use the ravines. And even though it's a parkway to carry lots of traffic, we let it meander. You want to enjoy the natural features and the large lots with the big houses and the natural landscaping. Everything, nature of war is a straight line. This is all, outside of crystallography, uh, this is all very akin to nature. So this was an alternative that we could choose from. And which way will we choose in Athens in 1923? Well, Beth Whitlock is here to answer that question for you. <laughs> okay, uh, Athens is being thrown into the progressive era, I guess you could say, and uh, all kinds of things are happening in a 20-year span. We start out with the separate public schools for the children of both races and streetcar service in 1885. Then 1890, the dispensary is formed where the government is taking over the supply of alcohol for prescriptions by doctors, which is an odd thing to do, but that's what they did. Uh, 1893, the war system is laid in town. In 1895, the normal school is open so that there would be teachers to educate all of those students that were in the public schools. In 1899, the first motor car comes to Athens, so not to be too long after that. 1900, the streets are paved. In 1901, the sidewalks began to be paved. Uh, now, Stephen mentioned about Levitt, had done a plan for UGA, and he wanted to do a city plan for Athens as well but there were no funds available for that. Um, this is a picture of Mr. C.D. Flanagan, who is the president of the Athens Railway and Electric Company, secretary for the Board of Ed, also the chairman of the Civic Improvements Committee. And this is an article from the Athens Daily Herald in 1914. Mr. Flanagan was very, much, very heavily involved in uh, the desire for city planning and with the chamber and um, public civic uh, improvement. 
uh, in, during in, in his time, and he was very well thought of. Um, then in 1914 in May, a group of students in the Education 9 course, which sounds like a futuristic type movie or something, um, in educational psychology at the Peabody School of Education, presented a survey of what the municipality should do for the citizens of the city and the country. And in this, over to the right, part of the section is city planning. And they were stressing parks and playgrounds, construction of better roads, um, better housing near the workplaces. A lot of different things were coming into play. They were very forward thinking. And it, it, with them, the students looking this way, the community should not be that far behind with being progressive, especially with parks and recreation. And they're not. Here are edit editorials and articles from the Athens Banner in 1914 and 1915. The top one, there is hardly a place to park the automobiles, much less the children. <laughs> the city needs a park and several playgrounds. Then underneath the article, Mr. Hugh H. Gordon, Alderman and Mayor Pro Tem, suggests the building of a swimming pool on the courthouse property. So they're looking at a swimming pool for the community, which is fairly forward thinking. The last one, playgrounds for old and young, and the second paragraph really says it all. Parks or playgrounds are particularly needed in East Athens and in the vicinity of the Southern Manufacturing Company's plant in West End. The children of the mills, after their long day's labor, need fresh air, and playgrounds would prove a great boon to them. So they're thinking, even though they're dealing with their children, child labor, at least they're thinking about trying to provide them some, some play time and play area. So the community is looking in this direction. Well, in 1923, Athenians will attend Cornelia meeting. This is a meeting of the Horticultural Society and Agriculturalists. That's a mouthful. Uh, attending were several uh, people from Athens, Dr. T.H. Haddon, Dr. M.P. Jarnigan, Dr. Andrew M. Sewell, who was the president of the, oh dear, what was it? The Georgia State College of Agriculture. Georgia State College of Agriculture. I can never get that out. And uh, J.W. Morton. The main speaker at this uh, conference was Warren H. Manning, landscape architect from Massachusetts. And this may be the first connection that the Athenians have had with him and with all the background of thinking about city planning, this may have spurred something that would result in what we see. But let's talk a little bit about Manning. He was born in Massachusetts in 1860, and his father owned a nursery where he learned a great deal about plants. You would have thought he was probably Harvard educated or whatever, but no, he learned all of his um, information about plants, most of it from his father, and he did a lot of landscaping uh, under his father's tutelage. Then he joined Frederick Law Homestead firm in 1888. He joined as a planting supervisor, but he quickly um, uh, went up in the ranks, rose up in the ranks. And we saw Homestead's design of Druid Hills a few minutes ago. He worked for eight years for Homestead, moving up in the organization, and he assisted him in his work on Biltmore Estate and Asheville. But the writing was on the wall, and he knew that um, his uh, Olmsted sons were going to be inheriting his firm, so he opened his own landscape design firm in 1896 in Boston. Uh, one well-known uh, activity that uh, plan he did was for Birmingham in 1919, and Birmingham plan is on Google Docs, if any of you are interested in wanting to look at it. It's been scanned and digitized. Uh, he recommended using available resources and stressed the importance of parks for the community. And during his career, he worked on over 1,700 projects, anything from golf courses to estates to um, uh, subdivisions. In fact, um, an interesting side, he designed the Fairyland subdivision at Rock City. <laughs> so that was quite an interesting thing to do. Okay, let's go back to Athens now, since we've learned a little bit about Manning. 
And August 1923, he was visiting Dr. John M. Reed, who was a UGA botany professor, and they were friends. So he was here just on a visit, not for any kind of professional um, reason. But Manning was per persuaded to speak to the chamber and to the people of Athens at the Georgian Hotel about parks and city planning. Dr. Reed informed the audience that the Alumni Association was making plans to establish a botanical garden and a site would be chosen soon. This was interesting at the time, too, that they're looking at that. And Manning and Reed both commented on the large varieties of trees located here in Athens, over 130 types, I think they said, which to me is just mind-boggling. Manny explained that three things need to be examined when you're planning a park. Recreation, transportation, and beauty. He also advocated for city planning, a tree zoning system, and a city transportation system. Since funds were very tight, Manny suggested that ravines and land that could not be used for building be donated for parks. That was a, a big part of his plan was that the city had no money and made that very evident to him before he started doing his plan. So he was very interested in trying to get donations. Over on the left here, we have Deering Park and Rock next to Rock Springs. And Deering Park is right now where the football stadium is at Clark Central. Um, the tree that owns itself, many of you know that. And then the one on the left is a, a little cut from a map, a tr the transportation map where he was trying to get the people uh, different transportation routes that were taking you from not going through town. Citizens Rally at Rousing Meeting was the headline. <laughs> On Tuesday, February 19th at Denmark Hall, in 1924, the Chamber uh, held a forum for nearly 200 loyal and enthusiastic citizens. And it also said they had to um, go through inclement weather to get there. So they must have had either snow or ice or something that day. Uh, but they were meeting at Denmark Hall, and they did have a meal before their meeting to formulate plans looking forward toward the further development of Athens and Clark Camp. And at this meeting, C.D. C. D. Flanagan here, he's Chamber of City Planning Commission at this point, he stated some things that were desired uh, to, as an outcome from this. Have an expert like Manning devise a survey of the city and offer a plan. And the second point, that there was a movement in the South for a botanical garden, and Athens could possibly be the site for this regional botanical garden. And to utilize the horticultural department of the university and he made the point that to do this survey and plans would cost around $2,000. And over there is um, the side of the botanical garden, which was between um, Cloverhurst and uh, Lunk, was where they proposed it. All of the attendees, all 200 people that attended this meeting were listed in the Athens Banner Herald oh, and the article. I thought that was very excessive, but I guess that was trying to make a point. Uh, the outcome of the meeting was there was a committee of uh, 29 influential citizens who were going to raise money for the chamber for the, to pay Manning to conduct the plan. And they succeeded with, with um, ra uh, raising the money. And the, all of them are listed. I pulled out a few, Dr. Strand, Carl Snelling, M.G. Michael, Harry Hodson, Fred Orr, M.J. Costa, A.C. Irwin, Mrs. E.R. Hodson, Jr., Joel A. Weir, Phillips, Tennessee, Miss Millie Rutherford, and T.J. Shackelford. So there were many others listed, but these were probably the ones that jumped out to me that I knew the names of the most. Uh, as Manny began his study in August of 24, he noted that Athens has the best natural drainage of any city he knows of, fewer railroad grade crossings of any city this size he knows of, and this was very important because trains were everywhere, uh, and there were trains all over Athens. More beautiful street flowers than any place he can recall. And one thing he made the point of uh, making it was not just the big homes, and their flowers and flower gardens. 
it was the, as he said, the less imposed, um, the, the lesser buildings. Like in other words, just small homes who had nice gardens. People took pride in their gardens. Um, the cha chamber displays the plans when Manning finishes in August of 26. And included are these maps and charts and this study. And the public is invited to inspect the plans so that they can be informed and be able to discuss them in a future meeting that they plan to have. But then the next encounter of the plan was in April 1926, I mean, excuse me, September 1926, when the paper stated that after display, the municipal committee would take definite action in the fall. And nothing was ever heard after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we figured there was no money, and they raised the money to do the study, and then the study was given to the city, and the city just put it away because they didn't have any money to implement it. I would like to put a plug in for, and this is the book. We've got this from UGA Library on Warren H. Manning. This is the beautiful cover. It's not on this book, but it's, it's really a great book about him, and there's a great chapter in here about Athens. It's written by Kevin Williams, who is a former flagpole columnist and a landscape architect graduate student. So if, if you have a chance, and it's just a, a three or four page article, but there are maps in here that uh, the Harvard does not have because they're in Iowa State, where his, his other materials are. Okay, I'll turn it over to Stephen again. That's the secret of our research partnership. Beth does all the hard work research and reading, and I just look at the pictures and make comments about them. <laughs> this book is wonderful. It was also a terror to us because this only came to our attention about a month ago. It's a brand new publication, 2017. It is beautiful for all of his breadth of planning. We're going to carry it into the room so you can take a look at it or leave it there. It's checked out to me. Um, <laughs> but, but it is a delight of a book and the Kevin Williams chapter is had, had a lot of information that we wouldn't have had otherwise, which was good. Uh, so, that is Warren Manning the man. How did he work? Uh, his method of operation is very, very interesting. And I think you've already formed the opinion I have that that he's a very appealing sort of person. This is not an aloof master who comes in from his studio, uh, walks around town for half an hour, and then goes home. This is a man who is very engaged and loves his work and learns his community. And that is exactly what, what we're going to see. First step that people note is he's a man born too soon. This man is made for geographic information systems. In order to study a system, he first goes in, utilizes the plans that are there, like that building plan I showed earlier. He had plans done by the uh, city engineer, uh, Captain Barnett, and then he augmented it by driving around town in an automobile, sketching in houses where they were missing. Let me caution you, there were still houses missing. I know there are pre-1925 houses that are not on this map. But overall, it's kind of neat to be able to look at a good estimate of where everything stood at a certain year. It has never been captured that way in history again until you get things like the 1946 aerial photographs and such like that. So Manny starts out by documenting what there is, the topography, the streams, the railroads, the highways, the buildings, as they are. Then, overlaid on that, he starts sketching in where the parks could go, where the roads could go, where the uses could develop. Now, this is long before zoning, although, as Beth said, he advocates seriously for zoning. So there's a whole slew of maps. We have about seven of them. There are many, many more in Iowa, most of them in the form of lantern slides. So they'll reproduce terribly well. OK, so geographic information system would be a great boon. He would love to do one of those Denmark Hall lectures just clicking his um, dial, I'm sure. As we already established, he's a boots on the ground man. He comes here, he runs around. Here in one of the photographs that illustrate his report, he didn't quite get out of the picture before the shutter went off. Uh, so this is, this is the one picture we have in Athens of 
Warren Manning scurrying down Hancock Avenue trying to get out of the range of the camera, but not fast enough. Now, I was so delighted when I got the first photograph of him and realized that was Manning. Um, he is a very, very much boots on the ground, appreciate the natural surroundings. One thing you'll see in the photographs later is he really was easily impressed by trees because the first thing all of us will notice is how many more trees we have today. Uh, Athens is enormously beautiful compared even to the Athens that impressed him. He also makes use of local talent. The Boy Scouts did a lot of footwork for him. Among the people he pulled in though, along with that group of 29, to do the parks and recreation planning, he, he wants an expert. So he brings in Athens' famous craftsman architect, Fred J. Orr, who built so many of the beautiful homes in the vicinity. This is, this is Fred smiling in his beautifully decorated craftsman. Wouldn't you love to meet with him to plan your house in that office? Beautiful craftsman office up in the, um, the Southern Mutual building. Higher than the Southern Mutual building, however, he enlisted our local aviator, Ben Epps, and climbed in the airplane. I think this is amazing. Here's a man born before the Civil War, but he wants to fly over the town and see what he's looking at. And in the Ben Epps collection at Harvard, there are a number of aerial photographs that, as far as I can see, from the buildings and all, date to about 1923, and I wonder if these are the actual plans that he flew. You see, in this case, he hadn't quite worked out where the plane's wing was on the, the Curtis JN-5 there, but uh, most of the other photographs are, are even better. Isn't it amazing to think of him using that technique? Uh, of course, he also drew on Van Epps' expertise in other ways, as we'll see later. And finally, he used the pub, he went to the public to sell his ideas. His report is constantly referring to how we have to sell you and have to have you buy in and you in, involved in designing the community you want. Once again, this is not the city beautiful. Knock it down, build a few temples, you're going to be happy. No, this is somebody who, I need to understand you, you need to understand what you want, let's work together. Um, on top of all that, what amazes me is that this man in Massachusetts, now I'm from Ohio, it took me years to master the plans appropriate to the South. And you know, Manning became very accomplished in that. He worked all over the country. Uh, so he held these public meetings, used lantern slides, all the advanced techniques of the day, lots of maps. Um, he was not above, uh, knowing that he had a lack of funding, this had to come from the community, he was not above uh, using enlightened self-interest as an argument, particularly for historic preservation. He was quick to point out that this will pay you in tourism. Uh, and pointed out that Salem and Cambridge, this is 1923, so really early in this, that Salem and Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Richmond and Charlottesville, Virginia, had long recognized the value of their historic architecture to bring in the tourist dollar. He was also fully able to appeal to pride in Athens. Not that we, we've done away with pride here, but in 23, apparently there was a lot of high thinking of ourselves. So he was quick to point out that Athens was ready to join the ranks of Atlanta, Minneapolis, Madison, Wisconsin, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and others with gifts of land to support these park and highway uh, developments. So he's willing to go out into public, by the way, that is not Denmark Hall. That's a, a stock photo stolen off the internet with this great Indian guru in the middle of it. You probably all thought that was Andrew Sewell in the State College of Agriculture, but it's not. Uh, he's willing to push his, uh, his goal to the public of traffic, getting better connecting and extending roads, and particularly dealing with trucks. He is fascinated and very progressive in looking at trucks. He's, it's no longer railroad sightings. Trucks are hauling things from railroads to factories, and we've got to get them around. Uh, parks and recreation, and using nature, utilizing nature, and historic preservation. As Beth said earlier, those are sort of his main points, and the report will reflect this. Okay, let's look at the maps. And again, I apologize. They don't work out very well. This is one of the best because it's really simple. This is Manning showing the major electrical lines. We're a very, we're a very early electrical city. 
with our streetcars and arc lights and electric hydro plants, and uh, we're very, very forward that way for uh, a, a city of 1923. Uh, he also is showing us the railroads spiraling out in all directions with the potential for stopping traffic. We live north of Bogart, so we wait for our share of trains when we don't go down the Cleveland Road overpass. Uh, let me just point out quickly here, the Bankhead Highway, there's a lot of information about the Dixie Highway, but we're not on the Dixie Highway. We're on the Bankhead Highway, named after Tallulah's uncle. And uh, to drive the Bankhead Highway in those days, we came down from Washington, D.C., along the Danielsville Road. Then, just like today, you hit MLK Drive, at that time, um, Water Street, and sort of kink around, go out Prince, no Atlanta Highway until 1938, not even thought of so. You go out Prince Avenue until you turn off on Mitchell Bridge, which sort of runs where Forest Heights Drive is. Now you can go that, if you've ever noticed in Forest Heights, towards the end there are one or two houses that are much older. And that was the old approach down to Mitchell Bridge. Then you go down Mitchell Bridge, up, and eventually connect up right where Aldi and Publix and the fire station are with what is now the road winder. So one of the things you run into in old newspaper articles is you'll hear that somebody is buying a farm out on the Bankhead Highway, which I always thought was Atlanta. Well, no, it's Bankhead Highway from Washington to San Diego where it survives. And so you'll find little bits of Bankhead Highway. I understand from my colleague Steve Armour there's a lost section over in uh, Winder that sort of sets north of today's uh, Route 78. Now, I mentioned Ben Epps. One of the fascinating things about flying with Ben Epps, uh, even if you do look like Popeye's grandfather, you get up in that airplane with him, and he points out the places for flying fields. I mean, how many are we going to need? It's an aviation age. <laughs> so, of course, there's Epps Field, where we still have it located. There is one south, down around where the golf course is, approximately, and I've never heard of that. Dan, have you ever run into it? Anybody? What um, golf course? Uh, the university. Oh, you know, I think, some fly away. Now, I've seen a photograph, an air photo from 1946 of the airport that was at Alps Road, and as some of you may remember, that consists basically of flat dirt and planes lined up. So we're not necessarily talking about hangars and patrol towers. <laughs> He wanted to put one out behind the normal school, or the medical campus, or Navy school, or depending on which area you're tuned into. Uh, and uh, this is a proposed airfield that they say would make a wonderful place to hop off. And of course, what he's thinking of is not, this is where the, you know, the jet of day from Atlanta comes in. He's thinking about everybody's going to have their private planes. <laughs> Ideally, I suppose, that's model airplanes that they'll buy from him. But uh, it's interesting to me that in 1923, He's really attuned to the flying age. There we are. Oh. Now this is the big plan for what he wants to do with highways proposals. And of course it's way too big for you to see, but this is where I can show you a couple of really neat things. One thing he wanted to do, he was really concerned about getting people north and south out of town. He said, here's our big entrance from the north, the Bankhead Highway. Water Street is too narrow. It needs to be broadened. Uh, I, I've done work at the Welcome Center, and how often have people pulled in and said, I'm so glad I found Athens. We were coming down 441, and then it just seemed like everything fell apart. And, uh, they, they got really nervous. And you know, Water Street, MLK Drive, north of North Avenue still makes you wonder where you're going to a degree. Manning recognized that clear back in 1923. He wanted to put in an extra bridge approximately where Sandy Creek is located to help bring traffic, use College Avenue more completely, bring folks in. Here's the amazing piece of information though. 1923, he wanted to take up where College Avenue, Ruth Street Bridge goes across, he wanted to make a major road up Ruth Street, take it almost out to where the Beltway is today, out by Trail Creek, curve it around, and have an outer belt around roughly a little over half of the city. Now, no Atlanta Highway, so it ends in this drawing over here at where um, Epps Bridge was, which as you know is pretty close to where the highway bridge is now, 
um, out there at Haven Allen. It's a little bit south. Sycamore Drive that runs back to Senior Soul and Holiday Inn is the old Epps Bridge Road going down to where the bridge was located. Um, so he's going to have to go that far. At that point, I guess you can get on Epps Bridge and go north. Or He figured anybody going to Atlanta is going to go out the Bankhead Highway route anyway. So that's a couple of really interesting big plans, but let's go in a little closer. He was obsessed by moving trucks around the downtown. As you remember, this is long before industry moved to the outside, to uh, Olympic Drive and all. So except for Princeton, Georgia Factory, the paper mill, most of the industry in Athens is in roughly uh, 180 degrees around the downtown. You start up in the north where the southern mill is, and the railroads all curve around. You then go down past the big uh, moss planing mills and the foundry. Chickpeas across the river here, but Athens Manufacturing, Climax Hosiery Mill, and then finally, uh, after a long day's work, you can end up at uh, Oconee Hill Cemetery, but that's not really one of the industries. <laughs> but as you can see, that's, that's sort of this big circular arc in the middle of that arc, all the railroads cut around. So he wanted a road where the trucks could speedily go between the factories and the railway stations, dropping goods, carrying goods. So he came up with, and he wanted to do it cheaply, remember? So he wanted to use as many existing underpasses as possible because he wants no grade crossings. You do not want to sit there idling your Mack truck. Uh, with post-war gasoline prices hitting 15 cents a gallon, uh, you want to get through. So instead, he, he came with a plan that would start down by the cemetery, use the overpass that used to bring Cemetery Road down in to the north of the Sexton's house. That was long gone. He would have really had to have upgraded that crossing from what I've seen of it. Uh, you then can go down along the river, utilizing the underpasses that are already there until you come up into north of the area and serve the factories and be able to go out to the Southern Manufacturing Company above the railroad. You have a lot of nips and tucks that don't exist to move tra uh, traffic around. One of the things you see here is he wanted Thomas Street to extend above Hoyt next to the Linden House and around the hill in back of it to give another way of going under the railroad that has the underpass of College Avenue. All of this tight little knot in here, he did not plan it. He left it for others to plan, but he did say you want to consider a Union Station. We may have a lot of trucks and airplanes running around, but the railroad is still how we move. So he said, you know, we've got four different railway stations stuck around town. Why not make a Union Station where they can all we can go and buy your one ticket and ship out and have your traffic and your freight and everything go. And, and he suggested that the good place to build over the tracks, so you have your Union Station above the tracks, would be up in the vicinity of Lumpkin, Pulaski, Cleveland. So up near where the Seaboard Station is and the Council on Aging, the, the railway station there, the Hoyt Street Station. And that's what these roads are serving off of Barber, Pulaski, Lumpkin, but he didn't really draw in where the station would be. He just wanted a good network of roads to handle automobile traffic up there. So those are two of his big plans. Uh, a lot of concentration north of town to make that really run, and then that big loop and the interior truck route. Now, by the way, he intended, as we'll see, this interior truck route also to be the Greenway. There weren't so many tree or trucks in those days that he didn't conceive that as a beautiful parkway that would be used by all. And remember, one of the big outdoor activities in 1923 is put the kids in the Ford, put down the top because it's a touring car most likely, and go out and get some fresh air and look at the trees. Uh, touring around is very central, I think, to the plan. And those of us locked in our little tiny steel cramped boxes full of air conditioning don't quite relate to it unless I imagine quite a few of you got taken out on Sunday rides back when you were children the same way I did. Let's look a little closer. Uh, I want to do this particularly for my friends here I, I see from Deering. Now even though the Atlanta Highway is long in the future, 
Manning recognized that Broad, being the big, wide street, should go further out of town. Now, as you all know, in 1923, or really long before, Broad Street choked off of Pulaski, largely because just down the hill was the University Botanical Gardens. And that was our one scenic wonder that everybody loved, which we closed and sold off in 1855 to build the iron fence. So, we, we have been lacking a botanical garden for a while at this point, uh, but he still saw the value with that out of the way of working out that curve on Broad Street, widening it. Now at that point, Broad Street really just ended where Hancock comes in, down near West Broad Street School. It then continued on what is still, it was still the Broad Street, Old Broad, and you would take Old Broad up until you connected with, in this case, the Shrine King Avenue going through, but more likely you went on up and connected with Epps Bridge Road, which still went south. If you ever want to drive Old Athens, turn right on Holman Avenue when you're going out broad and get ready to turn immediately left on West Broad, then turn on Epps Bridge Road, then follow it on down to the end of Sycamore, and you've driven the old way out of town, but stop at the river. There's no bridge there. <laughs> now, to make Broad a better way of moving people out of town, he anticipated out in this west end where there's nothing at this point, that it would become the center for big homes and lots of development. So to better handle that traffic, he created this convenient traffic delta at Broad Street. Why overload Broad? It's kind of narrow. When right here at Pope Street, you could just blast out new roads and make a traffic delta using Reese and Deer, um, full of old houses. And if this seems like a good idea to you, I want to stress that it is not too late to take out a lot of this old substandard housing. This is where the road up for Broad would run. We can take out the Bond house here. With this improvement, I could see a lot of other development. We can take out other old houses. I could see a beautiful, maybe, um, tree that owns itself, strip ball down at the end of the block, and bring in a lot of commercial. Let's face it, we've got it. We've got to deal with Coney County. You can't let them commercialize this out of, out of being. So keep this in mind. I, I think this is something the um, landscape architecture folks should have dealt with a long time ago. Did he misspell Deary? I mean, is he, he did. did. I mean, he did. Yes, he has yeah. D-E. He always yeah. Waddle is always Warwick. So he yeah. he. He was too busy walking around to look at the street signs, Pam. <laughs> okay, this is another one of the big maps just to show you some of the overview. This is his mapping of parts, and he is unrelenting on the fact that we have provided nothing. And as you know, those of us who've grown up around Athens for 30 or 40 years, we've only started cashing up in recent years. We still are not an overparked city. We have done some amazing things. I, I can't believe that we were able to get Trail Creek Park. If you haven't been there, being able to acquire lungs like that inside the Beltway is astounding. Um, so there's still possibilities, but we, boy, we almost missed the boat on that. If you look at how recently we built these parks. His major park is along, surprise, surprise, the Greenway. He has developed the Greenway Park System. Now remember, that includes his truck route, but it is landscape. He greatly values the scenic beauty of it. And according to Kevin Williams, I have not used Professor Charles Aguilar's papers, but Professor Aguilar of Landscape Design, who was so instrumental in developing the Greenway, Williams says that Manning drew, or excuse me, Aguilar drew heavily on Manning's plans and ideas in developing and pitching that project. So this is the big overview. It's going down to around the Oconee Hill Cemetery, all along our, our beloved Greenway now, until way, way, way up, uh, nearly where Sandy Creek Park is. Let's go in a little closer. Here's a close view of right down from downtown, the main stretch of the Greenway from Broad up to where the North Avenue Bridge goes across. And uh, as you can see, here is the Bluff Park. That just happens to be exactly where the little memorial plaza to Professor Aguilar is located. So that's a really nice touch. And you notice he wants lots of ways for people to get in and connect. 
out at the West End at Death Valley um, today, back in Central. Nothing much is happening to the south and west of here. So much of that neighborhood, which is now between Hancock and Broad, it's not there. And nothing further south of there except some golf courses and a few houses along Millage um, Heights. All of this really to the west and south is still open for development. But this area up around the Hancock, West Hancock Corridor has developed, as well as up next to the high school, where the high school will be in 1950. He wants to landscape a park. Now remember, as I said, not gonna, you can't lie, this is a racist Athens. It is segregated. But he did insist on having a good landscape park that would serve as an entrance, a recreational entrance, to where he thought the area would develop with African-American neighborhoods. The Brooklyn neighborhood, as many of you know, that's an early Freedman's town out there, uh, where a lot of people settled, but they tended to have more farm or garden lots. But he saw that as a place he wanted to get rid of that substandard housing along the ravines. He claims in his report he met with leaders in the African-American community. I bet it wasn't for long. But he did at least claim that he talked to them and that they said they are quite open to moving to Brooklyn or some other place if there was a fair exchange of value because they did not like the, the damp ravines, the steep hills, all of that. They, they saw that Brooklyn was a very nice place to live. And in segregated Athens, those were the realities. Manning had worked in the South. He knew that you had to recognize these things because, of course, it would have been none of that. You know, racism up in Ohio or Massachusetts. <laughs> uh, so, Deering is, is pretty neat that like, he stressed in the report we are going to have recreation for both races. Deering is notably smaller though, than the other parks. Um, finally, oops, here is a view of what Beth mentioned his sort of centerpiece. He was going to go from where the old botanical garden was above Broad Street at Pope and Reese and use that valley down Tanyard Branch to create a beautiful boulevard. Once again, traffic could drive this boulevard. It would, in fact, be a good thing as far as your automobile, because if you think about it, I didn't until I read Manning's report. I had to read a 1925 report to figure this one out, but as he points out, if you build a boulevard that enters back where my special collections building is around Baldwin, and follows Cloverhurst down to Bloomfield and re-enters Lumpkin about Woodrow Street down to the Butts Mayor building, you cut out a whole lot of the Lumpkin dip there. It's a pretty, you get a little slope down, a little slope up, and of course in his view you're driving through this beautiful scenery at the same time and resting yourself. Uh, really kind of a neat idea. You can, you can look at hundred-year-old reports and have them tell you things about your city that you're too dumb to figure out. So mm -hmm. it was kind of exciting. Interestingly enough, this botanical garden notion stuck around. This is something that continued to boil. In 1949, Hubert Owens pushed this idea forward of taking the Tanner branch and making it into a park. Finally, this is a, a picture from the book that's out map that's out in Iowa, we don't have. It's very blurry. This is something from the lantern slide. They you know, they're this big. They don't reproduce well. But what we have here is his more comprehensive parks and recreation. So in addition to big parks, golf courses, uh, Bob and Mill Park, which can also serve as a filtration system for the sewer, which I think is pretty neat. All around here, there are lots of play parks, recreation trying to get lungs into the city for people to enjoy nature, recognize what we have, and get healthful exercise. This was sort of the capstone where he sat down and did proposed use. This is where he jumps into, as Beth mentioned, to a plea for zoning. Because as he says, it's sort of the coming thing. Zoning is kind of an avant-garde idea. But if you don't zone, if you don't actually say, here's what you can do in this section of land, well, What's the point of planning if, uh, if somebody can go ahead and stick uh, a junkyard next to your house? Why even have a plan in the first place? 
So this is a detailed map where he is showing what he thinks we should do with our city, how it should develop. But he is always flexible. He stresses this will change as your city grows. One proposal he suggested is you're going to want to zone maybe lower quality apartments, smaller houses that will not have as long a life on future industrial districts or future parklands. When your city grows to that point, move the houses. Now, all you people who have read Tangible Past, remember, we move houses in Athens. Or maybe we'll just pull the apartment buildings down and build new ones further out. This city is going to evolve and change. I can only tell you what to do maybe up to 1933. So, let's go to the photographs and see how we did with our roadmap. Okay, given it by Manning, how do we succeed? Uh, and this, by the way, I love this. This is the earliest use I've seen of Athens, classic city. You can't read it too well. It's a 1925 photograph. Um, so you could get the Athens Classic City Radiator Badge at that time. <laughs> All right. Three main areas to the report, and I think you've picked up probably on what they are by now. Um, and Beth, jump in when I make miss an observation okay. here. We've, we've been wandering. Those of you who honked at us and said not hit us with your automobile over the last month, we thank you. We have tried to do before and after shots of many of these, and it's not easier. Traffic was lighter in Manning's day. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna see with these photographs how well we did looking at his three concerns: getting around town using our natural beauty, and recognizing the assets that were already here. First, let's go around town, and I think you all recognize this. This really doesn't look a whole lot different. We're coming up from, on North Avenue from the river where the road splits, and today you go around and then plug right back in to Darby Street. Guess whose idea that was? When this picture was taken, this was Hoyt Street. It just went off to Hoyt Street. This was Water Street coming down to the bridge. It was Manning who said in 1923, hey, once you get around the railroads, just swing this thing back over and connect them together again. It's your main route into the downtown. And there's a little before and after. The, uh, the buildings have gotten a little larger. Some of those temporary apartment buildings that Manning suggests we tear down, we need the land. But isn't it, isn't it amazing how that still looks? You know where you are. Or maybe it's not amazing, maybe you say that's pathetic. <laughs> uh, but we're still using these overpasses. Here we are looking the other way, and I love this, this skeptical man in his Ford Roadster there. And he's like, what are you down with that camera? Um, but you can orient yourself easily with the Seaboard Trestle and North Avenue. Look how empty it is going up the hill in 1923. <laughs> not much going on out on the east side, as I mentioned. And there's before and after. Once again, you can tune yourself in on the um, seaboard trestle. We were not, however, willing to die by standing in the middle of heavy traffic to get the exact thing. <laughs> we can do this. Okay, this one, this was a, some of these were really tough. This is taking some fun detective work. This is roughly at where the end of Darden Street was in 1923. That's about where. Uh, Henry Grady's father dumped all the coal tar that gave us our big EPA pollution cleanup site near the Classic Center. Uh, if you go to the end, though, and look out, there's our seaboard trestle. We're looking northward, north, uh, northeast. If, it, if it's blown up enough, you can actually see the little bridge down over the river. And I am a, I, it looks from the slope like this would have to be. We're not seeing the river because of the bank, and then these are houses over on Water Street. But I go back and forth on that. Unfortunately, there is an apartment block and a dumpster where I should be standing today. So this is a little tighter in, and this is one of the last photos we shot. So unfortunately, the leafing started to obliterate the trestle back here. But this is the Whistleberry Apartments up above the, uh, the greenway there. Uh, and I'm surprised the, the students walking past Glancing at us, didn't call the police. They were highly suspicious. <laughs> this is a great view. Recognize this? It's the old, have you ever been to Stone Mountain? Mm -hmm. This is, 
taken roughly from where the Charm Center is, the new recycling facility at the head of College Avenue, looking at the College Avenue bridge across the Ruth Street and some of the housing over here up Ruth Street on the east side along Water Street here. The river is down below this bank. Um, one of my neighbors on Holman Avenue years ago was Bill Britton, who grew up over here on the hillside in the 20s. And he talked about how, oh, we were always told, don't drive through the, the Ruth Street, or the, he called it the Ruth Street Bridge, the Ruth Street Bridge with your top down because there are murderers hiding up in the rafters waiting to drop down in your forehead and cut your throat. Uh, he also talked about a big flood when he was a small child in the 20s and how all the children gathered out in terror watching their fathers with their lunch pails walk across the seaboard trestle to get over to the foundry and the moss planing mill. Um, so this is very central. Again, they built the charm center where I needed to be standing, so you can't see, but once again, look at the trees. You know, well, you can't even see up into Barberville anymore for all the, the beautiful greenery. <clears throat> this is going above the moss planing mill, so I think roughly up where the abandoned incinerator is, up at the recycling center. And Manning's point here was that College Avenue could come on across into the land where the planing mill was, and instead of having a grade crossing, as it still does right there by Standard Oil Street, you could build a trestle underneath the railroad embankment that was built up behind it and get through. So he wanted really to upgrade everything up around in that area just north of the Linden House. And notice what you see on the lower left Yes. Is outhouse. Mm -hmm. And you'll see quite a few of those on some of the pictures. And he will make comments. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I couldn't really get a good photo. Again, we keep building things. But he was addressing getting up College Avenue and then across on Cleveland. Some things don't change much. <laughs> this is still the, uh, the underpass. You recognize this? The underpass at Cleveland. Um, right near Habitat. Right near Habitat, where it snakes, still snakes around at this 1920s angle. Um, I wrestle over which side this really represents. The south side works better with the landscaping, except for this. The north side works better with the road going off over to Barber and with some of the hillside, but it's more uphill now than it looks. Manning may have been a lot further back with a different lens that alters this. What I think is cool though, when you blow this photo up, and I haven't gone back to check, but blowing this photograph I took up, see this pole right here? It's just apparently an old concrete pole with paint flaking off it. I think that's it right there, telling you you're entering the Athens yards. But more work needs to be done. <laughs> Again, the more things change, you recognize this. Probably many of you have walked under it. The Baldwin trestle for the big yards over there. Now what they have done is they have, instead of having two lanes, they've opened up to one wider lane. But do you know why this lane is here? Have you ever walked under there and looked up? Do it. Um, don't open your mouth. Uh, this was where coal trucks were filled for Athens. The coal chutes are still up there, so you could pull your coal car over there, open up the chute, the scuttles are still there to direct the coal, but now you'll be dumping it on undergraduates instead of into a coal truck. This is pretty much the same, this is Chase Street, but they have made the uh, overpass look a, a good deal more reliable, I think. I'm pleased with that. Let's go to the second part of the report. Vistas, views, and parks. How to milk the scenic out of all this. And most of this is going to focus on the Tanyard Branch area, as, as is this photograph. Um, as you see, most of the housing in those areas, because of the terrain, has to be on fairly perilous pillars. It's, sometimes they fall down, sometimes they shift. If you've got an outhouse here, it probably drains really well down into Tanyard <laughs> Branch. Ironically, now Athens had a prize-winning um, system of sewers and water at that time, but 
down the valleys? No, you wouldn't get a connection down the valley to the sewers. That's where we ran the sewer. So the sewer main is going right down here, eventually goes down to Bobbinville. But these folks were not on the sewers. Now, I mentioned the university's botanical garden that was disassembled and sold off for land in the 1850s. It was filled with housing because it's uneven housing, generally housing to African Americans. Some of it was very good housing stock, and you still see some good houses over there. These are not. Think of what you would pay for that house on Boulevard today. Uh, up here, I think it's hidden, right back here is the home of Madison Davis the African-American legislature site from Athens during uh, Reconstruction along with Alf Richardson, prominent restaurateur, uh, major figure in town, very well respected. Uh, he had his very fine house there, and I think that may still be his house standing on the corner. Uh, Sanborn seems to show a house of that shape going a long way back. He also owned a lot of other property up here. So this is, for me, 1924, the earliest view into what was the botanical garden. And I get the sense that 70 years later, there may still have been a lot of attractive plantings. So I said it had been an area for first industry, the McGinty's, the famous house builders, had their planing mill down here till it burned. And uh, then there was uh, really just used for infill housing. Another view today, this is the view uh, as you look off. Terraforming is amazing. We have altered the terrain so much with bulldozers, scrapers, that sometimes it's hard to believe this is even the same place. Now, looking from Newton into this valley, we are in back of this, I think it was built as a motel, but I believe it's now apartments. How can we tell? You'll probably just have to take my word for this, but in the back there of the photograph, you can see the bell tower on St. Stovall Chapel, and it still pops up in about that same view there. Uh, you probably can't see that, so we'll just tell you, 1924, 19, or 2018, there are these big red circles. It's unmistakable. <laughs> now, you may notice there's another steeple here. This drove us crazy. It's too close to be the church up on Reese Street. What's going on? Finally, we found out. Anybody know the answer? You know. What is it? No, it's not the water tower yet, because we're looking the other direction. Good guess, though. It's the Knox Institute. They had an iron derrick bell tower, uh, and it shows up on the sandboard. So that, I think, is the top of the bell tower that they erected out behind the Knox Institute. Uh, by the way, all this is guesswork. So, if you want to push the water tower thing, <laughs> go ahead. We're not sure. We're just giving you our best guesses yeah. here. We're detectives. Recognize this, though. Laconi Street, just up from Nucci Space. Of course, the tower is still there. Mm -hmm. And this wonderful old red brick building. The Ford, unfortunately, is gone. I wish I had it to park there. Um, I'd like to say this is because Manning recognized this as a beautiful stretch of street and would be appalled at us tearing down St. Mary's, which I am. But actually, he was just saying, this is about where I want to plug in my truck route, so uh, maybe he would have knocked down St. Mary's anyway. This is our favorite piece of detective work in the whole thing, because I, I like the Fords, I love antique cars, and I really want to know where this junkyard was. So I'd kill for any of those vehicles back then. <laughs> and where is this? Well, Manning was pretty obscure in his description. There are descriptions of what he's trying to show in the photographs. And Beth and I had well, maybe about three or four potentials when we started out wandering. First one we went to, though, is here. This is down where the pottery was off of East Broad Street, down near Weaver Deeds. And we got back there. Now, I cannot stand where Manning, and when Manning stood here and took this photograph, this was somebody's in-town farm. Now it's an impenetrable thicket. Yeah. So I had to fudge a little bit on camera angle, but we're there wondering, and all of a sudden Beth says, ah, look at that. The last house in the neighborhood oh. is this one with that distinctive triangular mm -hmm. ventilator at the top. So sometimes you get a break and can yeah. confirm your best guesses. Added benefit, when we turned around, 
I think that may be the last of the old street posts in Athens. It's down there at the corner when your generous contributions build the Athens Museum. And by the way, did you know Bogart has a museum when we don't? <laughs> when you build the Athens Museum, we need to dig this up. I was so angry with myself that I didn't go and grab the one for Holman Avenue and Gloria when they took down. Well, some of you may not have been here long enough to know that we didn't have street signs. When I came here in 79, we had these concrete posts with the names of the streets painted on them. So if you wanted to know if you would need to turn your <laughs> crane around like that. But it was kind of a nice touch, quaint. All right, here's a great one. This is taken from the hill above the Sexton's house, about where that road came over on that overpass out of Coney Hill Cemetery. Uh, now, trees and apartments have pretty well obliterated the view. Well, let's go in a little closer, because this has the best view I know of the Cars Hill. As you can see, here are the mausoleums in the Jewish section of the synagogue. The beautiful mausoleums down there. And then the, what's called the factory section up here, with its wall, the Sexton's house is out of the photograph. This is the old Mansard mill, Mansard roofed mill that stood down roughly where the new Greenway goes down. Call, I think they call it Epps Mill now the entrance there. This is probably the site, not, not Epps Mill, Easley. So this is probably the site where Dan Easley, our proto-businessman of Athens, had his sawmill and grist mill, and then they built this mill later on top of it. It was also one of Athens' first electrical generating plants, so it's kind of too bad it's pulled down in the 60s. But looking across the hillside, we see a Coney Methodist tower there the back of the Oconee Street School. Up here is roughly where the railroad depot was. And if you go, correct me on this, Gary, we've got the expert here with us. In fact, isn't that you walking? <laughs> <laughs> what does a six-year-old have a cigar? I was born, I was born in 1939, not 1839. <laughs> Stick to that story. Anybody believe it? Okay. Um, I think it's kind of neat if you go up. Uh, Roughly to where Maxine Eason said her grandmother's house was over here, these two houses with the hip roof are still up there. They've been heavily remodeled, but there's still two identical two-story houses with hip roofs up there on uh, Georgia, Georgia Depot Street or Georgia Street now, right? Guys? Now Georgia Street, Street. Or Georgia Depot Street. Yeah. 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 So you can see it. And of course, I'm sure many of these other houses on back this way are still there. Now, I'm not going to go through every photograph Manning showed of where the Greenway is now, but he loved views of the trees along the Oconee River, North Oconee, and really stressed the beauty here. I took one representative shot out back at the Linden House where you can still get a little bit of the same sense that he was seeing uh, thanks to these new student houses over here. It's almost like I faked that view of over into Barkville, but they're new buildings. I mentioned earlier, River Bluff Park in Manning Plan is where the monument is to Professor Aguilar, who worked so hard to develop the Greenway. Here it is, looking over the North Oconee, and you can see. Let's pat ourselves on the back. We may have screwed up a lot, but we really, really did right with preserving that river valley. And this is a nice bit of evidence. Warren Manning is happy. Not so happy here. This was described as attractive ravine just north of College Avenue Bridge. So this is roughly running out of where the Charm Center is now. Uh, apparently Manning really saw a lot of potential up there. Uh, however, right now, it, as best as I can tell, crawling through a lot of brambles is a four-foot culvert coming out of an infill ravine. So don't, if you wanted to buy this attractive lot, you're too late. Uh, it has been filled in. The, I took this picture from the other bank over where the Greenway Park parking lot is, just as the entire Athens Police Department descended. Apparently, I think somebody must have run across the road into the Greenway after doing something nefarious on the other side. And so I'm 
Beth is trying to wait in the car for me because the palm was so heavy. So I come out of the brambles with my camera and start walking up the road, and I notice it's full of police cars. So I cleverly turn. <laughs> And they're driving down the green one. Yeah, I, I guess I do not look as criminal as I try to. Because they, they didn't pay any attention to me at all. Now, all right, show of hands. Uh, how many of you look at this and say, oh, that's Sanford Stadium. Give me my whiskey. Uh, this was the old entrance to Oconee Hill, one of the two entrances to Oconee Hill, under the railway, roughly at the east end of the stadium before the stadium was built in 1929. Yes, Virginia, there was a time when there was no stadium, yeah. at least not there. Uh, this was an entrance by the, uh, the North Hill here that went under the tracks. This was known as the Sapelo Street entrance. Sapelo Street used to run down from Lumpkin and sort of tend towards where Tanyard Branch now is under the stadium. Uh, they did away with this filled in underneath the bankway, and for years until they built the east end of the stadium, for all you innocent types here, I don't believe you at all, uh, this is where you would go as a student to sit and watch the football game if you didn't want them to enforce those silly rules about uh, beer, marijuana, and uh, whiskey. So this was the wild party <laughs> section, and I remember the screams. Yeah, yeah, I can't believe you're all pretending. Like, Bobby, you knew that, now, didn't you? <laughs> um, so, all right, maybe I just maybe I just imagined that. <laughs> and I don't even like football. Okay, this is how I got acquainted with this whole project. This photograph appeared in a really otherwise great book on. Oglethorpe County Plantations, describing how the Barrows, Sill Creek, Sill Fork, Sill Creek Fork, Sill Fork, Sill Fork, that how it turned into tenant farm. Why am I not talking to the experts here? Between you and Mary, you should be able to correct everything. Um, thank you. The book tells about how this was altered into a tenant farming situation and the, re the reconforming of the housing structures and all. But they put this photograph in saying, tenant farmer's cottage. Well, if that's a tenant farmer's cottage, what is going on here? And how did a tenant farmer in the middle of Oglethorpe County get an arc light? <laughs> this seems suspicious. So I went to the man, sorry Larry, the man who really had the photographic memory and knew everything. You all remember Nelson Morgan, our photo archivist at Harvard. I showed this to Nelson and said, I call bunk on that. An arc light in the middle of Oglethorpe County in the 1920s, and he looked at it. Of course, he was able to say, "Oh no, that's page 16 of the Manning Report." Manning Report, you see. And what is this Manning Report of which you speak, Nelson? And he introduced me to it, and I could not believe there was such an incredible assortment of photographs. So, anybody have an idea where this is? Pardon? You got it. All right, there. What is it? This is. This is roughly at the corner of Newton and Reese Street, and this is the one, this is the old in-town full lot that belonged to James Letcher Mitchell, better known to his friends as Slickhead, um, the very noted secretary, banker, he probably was in Southern, everyone was in Southern. Everyone was an attorney. <laughs> Everybody was from Southern Mutual. Right. Um, but a very, a very key leader uh, in Athens and university history. And this was his, this rather interesting house, which looks like a very early one that he'd added on to. Uh, he had that whole lot facing the back of the Kamak house. And so a big city, for modernists, big city bread is about over here. So how is that building? Which? No, that's, that, that's the Southern Mutual Insurance Company. It's a lot of convenient. Now, that, I'm, I'm sure that is a necessary house. Oh, that one, yeah. Um, yes, the little one there. And the other was just a, um, a cabin. I mean, yeah, yeah, I see it. Probably, probably for somebody who worked for, probably right. from an enslaved by Mitchell. Well, there's somebody yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, one, we don't have time to show it. Beth and I did a little slide presentation of our own saying they're running all around. It's fun to find all the people hidden in these photographs. Mm -hmm. Blow them up, they're blurry, but it, it has a different view of Athens. And yes, 
There is the woman sitting in the entrance of the cabin. You may not have plumbing, but you have got an arc light. Mm -hmm. Again, that's what street. Okay, there's here's Here Newton and Me? Reese. And Reese. Mm -hmm. So now there's another one of those apartments. Remember the that showed up in the other picture too, the apartment-like development. And the face is on Hancock now up here. His house, Mitchell's house, was on Hancock, but pretty far down the block, heading out away from town. Maybe he did not want to look at the back door of the Comex. I don't know. Uh, but here's a, a little blow-up of it. Really interesting structure, and the footprint is dropped dead the same on the sandboard map, Atlas maps. Uh, so that's the view today, uh, Janice. So it's sort of looking to the north, east, but think of it as looking towards the big city bread, mm -hmm. and the bottle works more or less. I think you'll agree a lot of improvements have been made to Newton going up from Broad Street over the years. <laughs> This is looking the other direction at Reese and back towards Newton in back of the telephone exchange at Pulaski and Reese here. And so really not, except for building a transmission tower, not a lot of change there over the years. Now this is just down from the tree that owns itself up here. This is where we get into his dreams of a great park. This is the ridge along Finley hanging above Tanyard Branch where it crossed and used to be above ground behind the Holiday Inn Express. And this is where he thought the real potential for beauty was going to lie in Athens. He had a lot of photographs. This one is about from the side entrance of their parking lot, I think. This hillside has been cut down. This is now where Parkview Homes is located, looking down Newton into Tanyard Branch. Special Collections building is over behind around here. Interesting thing on that list of participants in 1929, there was one person who must have been quite a young man, Joel Weir. Joel Weir later became head of the Chamber of Commerce and directed to the development of our first two public housing developments, Parkview and Broad Acres. And of course he built Parkview here if you have gone to the Brown Media Library website, in 1947, he took a fascinating film. We just call it the town film. And after a lot of scenes of men with cigars and fedora hats downtown coming out of hotels, uh, he had a whole section filmed in here. A lot of these houses are still there. But he wants to show the contrast of the older housing stock with his new shiny public housing that was making such a difference for folks and um, giving them electricity, plumbing, and stoves for the first time. Lots of views along Tanner Branch, so many of these feet are underground now, but I think this may be down to where the Chew Crew, if you know the goats who eat the weeds over at the university, where they work down below the uh, Hall Street parking deck. This is a fun one. This is where Tanyard Branch, when it was above ground, crossed under Newton and went on down. When you go there today, near the Holiday Express parking lot, they buried the whole kit and caboodle under, but they left the concrete buttresses above ground for the bridge. I, ha I like to think that Manning at least got them to replace this rickety business with a concrete bridge. And why go to the trouble of jackhammering that down? You can just leave it standing there as a, a target for drunken drivers. So you could drive there today and pretty much figure out exactly where you would be standing in 1923. More shots. Uh, as you can see, not all the housing was really in terribly bad shape, but you still got the hills and ravines. One thing Manny recognized is this area was full of folks who needed two things. One, they needed to be near there, they worked and that they passionately wanted their own homes. And so when he talks about taking this down, putting people in Brooklyn, putting people in Allenville, these other areas, he is very conscious, I think, of he's dealing with real people, real homes, people who have pride in their homes. Joel Weir did too. One point that I love in the town film, he shown all of these terrible ramshackle houses, which by then were close to a century old, but he focuses long on this one elderly woman whose house is falling down, 
but her whole porch is nothing but climbing roses. And I love to think that's why Joel Weir focused on that at the very end of his section on the deteriorating house, to remind us these are people who love their homes with aspirations. It's not because they chose to have a house look like this. Uh, I think it's kind of neat. So check out that 1947 town film on the Brown Media website. It's fascinating. Here is roughly at Waddle, looking up towards where the Hall Street parking deck and the Special Collections building is. This is Waddle coming down. Newton is below. Uh, as you can see, I, I should have mentioned at the beginning, these photographs are all by a man named H.L. Boyd, who worked for the Athens Electric and Railway Company. So C.D. Flanagan probably assigned him to do the task. Uh, he was not necessarily the world's best photographer, but at least he could take a picture without getting his thumb. <laughs> so, I'd like to tell people there's just a severe storm coming in. We're just kind of <laughs> View on down Newton Street, you can see pretty much where they've lined up the public housing in the 50s to replace these houses. Some of the other more substantial homes that were in the area, this was torn down for Park View. More of the homes on the side, once again, fascinating you know, people about their business walking around, but you can see the big problem. Privies are going to drain into wells. This is a terrible place to build. Now, today, of course, we would build this five-story advanced avant-garde home with elevators and all in there and say, this is the coolest lot in Athens. Mm -hmm. Not so in 1925 technology. And as Beth mentioned earlier, Manning is always deploring that even in the city, and I have no idea where this is, even in the city, there are so many people still dependent on outhouses and wells. Okay, we get to what he thought was going to be the scenic wonder, and it's still there, and most of the people here, I bet, don't know about it. At the very end of Waddle, where it plugs into Newton, if you go right into the parking lot, Cross Waddle, where you usually see big piles of mulch or other park sort of like stuff dumped temporarily by the city, you will find the Athens Quarry. At the turn of the century, right below Daring Street, in fact, right where Waddle Street used to go up the hill to Finley, right below Finley Street and Deering, the city started blasting out rock to build the streetcar line and improve them. And for years, they blasted this out in spite of uh, John Carlton? Oh, it was one of the Carlton. Well, uh, Con Congressman Carlton, who on hard times had moved to a house up here on the top and had said he'd shoot anybody trying to work that quarry or give orders. He was tired of the noise. <laughs> but they blasted out of the hillside this quarry. You walk back in there, and yeah, there's beer cans. It's not, it's, it's damp. There's bark. But you would think you were in the North Georgia Mountains. Mm -hmm. It's full of springs. Uh, Manning mentioned how beautiful it was. And uh, he really thought this would become a show place. And it's still there waiting for us. Mm -hmm. This is a view from the top of the hill. There's an apartment complex up above the quarry off of Finley <coughs> Street. And we went back in and photographed uh, up there. Uh, Bill Mann also points out there's a little lost road up there called Garrett Street. Garrett? Garnet? Bill Mann, you may know this. Pardon? Gartrell. Gartrell. Uh, so you know about it too, actually. It's, it's, well, I don't know what, what any way you're going to do with this secret. I guess you're going to claim it from the city. There's this little stretch on the tax map showing Little Walls of Gartrell Street still up hanging on the hillside. And that's roughly back of where I'm standing. Here's a view into the quarry. Uh, this is a flaw in the photograph. There is not a Tulula Gorge fall up there. This is just a, a, either it's a streak or somebody's dumping a whole lot of whitewash down the hillside. I think it's just a flaw. However, you can see what you do find back there. These beautiful rock walls, lots of seeping springs. Manning thought it had wonderful, wonderful greenery. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't take any kind of today photograph whatsoever because it's so overgrown. Town assets, go quickly through those. We don't know where this bush is, so I won't say anything more about it. But this is Manning going back with those big house and small house gardens alike. This is on Waddle Street. Can't determine where, but isn't that a wonderful house in the background? 
I'm thinking it's behind some house facing Lumpkin, and this might be some of the housing stock that stood over on Waddle. At this time, next to the Georgian Hotel was a private home with beautiful gardens looking up towards the ballroom. Uh, now it's a parking lot. This was a tricky one until we figured out there's the side of the Holman and there's the fly attic on the Morton. This is roughly where Clocked and the Iron Barbecue is on Hancock Street. At that time, it was a street of private residences, many of which rented rooms to students. It had this attractive gardens out front, but then they tore it down, moved the buildings all forward, and you get this interesting angle. Down opposite Hotel Indigo at College and Doherty. At that time, Doherty, Hancock, was a very fine neighborhood, full of very nice houses, birth area, Fred Birchmore, for instance. Uh, it all was pulled down as part of the urban renewal in the early 1960s, on which Beth and I hope to do a future program, because it's a fascinating story. Further up on Hancock at uh, Jackson, with not only this garden, with, with another person sitting out on their porch, but the beautiful synagogue that was demolished in the bank. What a, what a loss that was. Now you get a wonderful view of this, this Dodge and the Russell building. Well, some things don't change very much, uh, including this magnolia tree. Now we're going to look at some photographs of this site, and the poor reason why Manny was putting these in is he said, you need to trim these trees. You can have beautiful in-town trees, but they're going to choke each other out. And they did take these oaks down, and look at that. That's almost a century later. <laughs> he liked the First Presbyterian Church. Uh, the Methodists, hold on, you'll get your turn. Baptists, too. But uh, here's a view. Costa Ice Cream Plant is still down there, which you may remember as the um, police department substation downtown. The Chamber of Commerce building, which is today the Board of Elections, replaced this building, which I think is, I read in the city minutes, where uh, after pushing the Dubaian forward in the first place, as soon as Captain Barnett got his Model T so he could drive out to, to construction sites around the county, he started lobbying for a garage on the city hall and put his Ford in. And I think that is probably his garage and his Ford. As you can see, the view hasn't really changed much, but the cars are brighter. He was not uniformly impressed with everything he found downtown. However, Ben F got to him again, Dan. And convinced of what, you may remember some of the aerial photos where you see a sun, an arrow pointed on buildings downtown with Athens pointing you to Epps Field from the 20s and 30s. Well, Ben Epps said, well, look, we're going to turn this into the Athens Beacon. It would flash a signal to the modern man in his biplane that <laughs> there's Athens ahead. He can fly on in. And while he, he was not terribly fond of this stance, he said, well, let's just brick up a building around the ugly legs and we get more offices, but then we'll have our beacon flashing in here. Um, we tore it down. I think we're probably ahead of the game. This is the place next to the First Presbyterian we saw earlier. At this point, this is Dean Tate's uh, fraternity. Help me, I'm, a, I'm an independent. I think it's Delta Tau Delta at this time. Is that? Yep. And uh, you can see the, the boys lounging around out here in their rustic furniture. But this is where Manning was stressing, A, we have great historic texture in town, but B, with some trimming of the trees, this could be spectacular. Instead, we pulled it down in 1940 to build the new post office, which is now on the site. Uh, but not until after a letter campaign to Eleanor Roosevelt trying to convince her husband not to demolish it, which I think is neat. Um, back in the corner, there is this structure, uh, right next to First Presbyterian over here, which Manning said, this needs to be preserved as a museum of housekeeping of the 19th century. I mean, to take these servants' quarters and show how people actually live, which is great, except this wasn't the servants' quarters. Mr. Scudder was one of the pioneer schoolmasters before there were 
public schools and had a very successful school. As far as I can read, this is Scudder's school building back here. Also gone, of course. Uh, Warren Manning, as he was scurrying out of the camera here, he included this photograph of what was then the K.A. house to show how they had trimmed their trees and had gotten pleasant growth. So that's the purpose of this photograph. And I know many of you may recognize this is on Hancock, opposite First Presbyterian. This building still stands on the corner of Lumpkin and Hancock. You may remember this house stood really until just a very few years ago. The porch had been torn off. The windows had been glass bricked in the front. It had been painted white. But it still is the last remaining house of what was very, very recently a very major residential district of Athens uh, where the doctors tended to congregate, I think because of the Everleela Sanitarium and Dr. Moss's facilities down the hill. Some things don't change very much, although I really prefer the church when it still had its Gothic front on it. But this was another example of the historic sites that people would come to see if we had the good sense to preserve them. I think the cars look better then. I like the Gothic front. And this photograph does preserve one thing which I think is the greatest loss in Athens. This magnificent Victorian weather. And I, I, I used to love seeing that every time I came into Athens. And that's been taken down now. What a glorious, glorious piece of work. Uh, this was misidentified as being on Pulaski Street. This is, I think, the house I get to look out on every day at work. The Ray Nicholson house, which was almost gone, but was saved by collaboration between the city and the university. Uh, it still is it's being restored to excellent condition. Uh, I do not think we have done as well with the street furniture, and I will go on record as not a fan of the fiberglass bulldogs, I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, just to get across to it anymore kind of undercuts the 19th century beauty. But if you haven't been, have you ever been up into the yard? You know, it was famed for its gardens. And it still has the formal rose gardens out to the side that the university's bringing along. It's, it's worth a step past the bulldog and up to the front. Ross Crane House still looks pretty much the same, except the magnolias have gotten even bigger. And they've built the wings on the ends that now accommodate the fraternity. But I think Manning would be, would be delighted to go have a, a beer at the 40 watt and see that this house was still standing. And finally, so we, we hit all the, the three big denominations downtown. I love this photograph, and I love it for exactly, Beth does too, we love it for exactly the reason Manning hated it. We need zoning, this gas station is ruining the whole city. I love that gas station. <laughs> but, it is cool, but at First Baptist, down there at the corner of Hancock and Pulaski, it was a, just a four-year-old building at this point. Model T's are spinning past creature comforts here. But it shows how vibrant and active Athens was. <coughs> yeah, many of the photographs, I guess people didn't want to be in the photograph with Manning, so they ran out. But this really does, it does have that sense of bustle. And there it is today. Pretty much the same, and that lot is still open if there's anybody with some money to invest in a gasoline station. <laughs> and finally, that is an overlong presentation, but we really wanted to show you all those photographs. Thank you for being patient and bearing with us. This is the cover of the report with this glorious Egyptian motif. And at the end, the thank you to the community from Warren Manning, talking about the great cooperation and how with the public spirit of citizens, it was really up to us to go out now and make this plan a fact and make this a city we would love to the point where we'd be doing crazy things like joining a historical society. <laughs> so thank you all.